I was asked by the Surgeon General of Taiwan to go over there and, and figure out why they had diabetes. I spent three years on and off doing research. And I, I said to him, it's your diet. But I didn't know what in the diet at that time. A uh, hamburger, the bun, the cheese, the french fries, all the things, the ketchup, the soda. Number one of all those items, the soda. It's sugar. Can you imagine 37 countries, 20 years of cash register receipts, what that cost to obviously prove that big soda, big pharma, farming, they're all in a collusion together. This is such a horrible, horrible problem. Why is sugar so bad? Like, what does it do to the body at a cellular level? You know, you mentioned what it does to the nervous, but get, get into the detail. Why is sugar so bad? Why is it, to you call it toxic to the body? Dr. Richard Jacoby, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Well, happy to be here from sunny Scottsdale. Yeah, I'm in here in sunny Miami, Florida. Actually, it's overcast today, but usually sunny Miami, Florida. Um, I'd love to for you to introduce yourself to my audience. I know your work. I know your amazing book that I have right here in front of me. But what's your backstory? How did you get involved with what you're doing today? Well, it's an interesting story. It's, it goes back actually about 40 years ago. I was asked by the Surgeon General of Taiwan to go over there and, and figure out why they had diabetes. So 1981, I go over there, Surgeon General, his name was uh, Dr. Luke Chu. And he um, was four-star general. He fought with Chiang Kai-shek, as a matter of fact. And he was the head of the medical school. And he asked me to come over. He knew my name through some papers I had written back then. And um, first question I asked him, I said, uh, what do you call diabetes in Mandarin? And he goes, diabetes. I said, well, that's a Greek word. Um, what do you call it Mandarin? I said, well, we don't really have a word for that because it's, it's really a Western disease. First fast food restaurant, 1979 in Taipei. I'm there in 1981. He thought he had a pandemic. I said, no, I was all over the country, went to their major cities. I really didn't see that many diabetics but really it was unknown to them. So I spent three years on and off doing research. And I, I said to him, it's your diet. But I didn't know what in the diet at that time. And interesting, they put on this banquet for me. And I said to them, I said, what's for dessert? Because I was eating sugar too. And they went, dessert, what does that mean? I said, well, something sweet after dinner. They scurried around, they found some ice and they put some coconut milk on it. And I had ice milk. That was the extent they had. So I was confused as what was in the diet that was causing this epidemic. And the answer is, it's interesting. I'm familiar with um, uh, Fat Chance, uh, Dr. Lud, uh, Lustig. Yes. Okay. He just was talking about this study. It was 37 countries, 20 years, cash register receipts on fast food restaurants. And they looked at all the variables. Uh, hamburger, the bun, the cheese, the french fries, all the things, the ketchup, the soda. Number one of all those items, the soda. It's sugar. And that's the answer, which we know. But that really kind of proved the point. Can you imagine 37 countries, 20 years of cash register receipts, what that cost to obviously prove that big soda, big pharma, farming, they're all in a collusion together. This is such a horrible, horrible problem. So it's sugar. And my book is about how did sugar, how did it affect our body and what's the biochemistry of it? And how does it change all the, how do we get all these itises as I like to call them? And why are they sound so different? Well, they're not. They're just labels on the inflammation where it happens. I'll get into the genetics as well and the biochemistry, but it's really nerve compression. So that's that's my thesis. Yeah, uh, it's so fascinating because you got there in 1981. I wasn't even born yet. I was born in 1984. And Don't rub it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, Doc. Okay. Uh, and they were actually blessed to have you there right from the beginning because you were able to actually educate them on uh, – insulin resistance, diabetes, and the cause of it. So you, you, why is sugar so bad? Like, what does it do 
to the body at a cellular level. You know, you mentioned what it does to the nervous, but get get into the detail. Why is sugar so bad? Why is it to- you call it toxic to the body? Well, it's a poison. It really is a poison. Now, there's a, an assumption now, and your your age group in particular, because you never knew what our diet was like before. I had a, some semblance of it. So when I grew up, well, let's take fruit. When I was a kid, we put sugar on a grapefruit because you couldn't eat it. It was so tart. Fruit is not sweet. Fruit is tart. And they say that's a misnomer now because when you eat it, because you love the fruitness of it, it's the fructose, it's sweet. Table sugar is really glucose, which is not sweet, mixed with fructose, which is sweet, and that's called a disaccharide. Well, that's poison, but we love it because the hippocampus in your brain is the addiction center and it turns off the enzymes that cause cessation like uh, with the uh, leptin hormone and we can never get full or actually we can't get satisfied eating fructose. You just can't. So you just continually eat. That's why when people are morbidly obese, you say, well, how could you eat that much? Well, they're, they're addicted. This is probably 20 times worse than cocaine. Wow. So it causes a chemical reaction. So where did this whole notion come from? Well, there's a guy by the name of Ansel Keys, and you've probably heard this story. Mm-hmm. But he did the seven-country study. He went to Europe with his girlfriend, who was a phlebotomist, probably on taxpayer money, spent the summer in Europe. And it's a nice gig. And he told us that sugar was causing... The, the heart disease. Well, what he didn't tell us was it was 22 countries he visited. The other 15, it was sugar. And that started the ball rolling. So he but said, it, what it, you, it, you mentioned those, those seven countries, he said that cholesterol was causing heart disease, correct? You said sugar. Excuse me, cholesterol was causing heart, heart disease, yeah. which is an absolute lie. Mm-hmm. Never did and never, and, it, it, and I can explain that and because that's part of my journey. When I ran into Dr. Cook up at Stanford and he explained all this biochemistry to me. But I really want to go back in the story where the, the chemistry of this. There's a guy by the name of Verkel, and this is in the 1800s in France. He spoke five languages, one of which was Greek. He opened an artery, looked inside, and he said, what's this gunk? Gunk in Greek is athro, and sclerotic gunk is atherosclerosis hardening of the arteries. Well, that's not a disease in my way of thinking. That is a process, and it's an observation. Why was it there is the real question. Let's segue forward to Dr. Cook, Stanford, 20 years ago. I had text Dr. Cook because I was on a mission by now in probably year 2005. And let me backtrack to Dr. Dellen down at Johns Hopkins. So Dr. Dellen's a peripheral neurosurgeon. He's written all the papers on nerves, carpal tunnel, ulnar tunnel. Patient says to him, Dr. Dellen, why don't you fix my legs for diabetic neuropathy as you fix my wrist and my elbow? He said, well, that's a different disease. Then he thought about it. He said, wait a minute. You're diabetic, nerve compression, nerve compression. Let's look at it. He's a genius. He's written probably 75 chapters in, in textbooks, 800 articles. He's written two textbooks. He's the guy, Dr. Lee Dellen. He trained me. And he's right. So, but I was at the wound care center here in Scottsdale that I helped start about 30 years ago. And I trained with Dr. Dell and I came back and I instituted it here. And they were going, oh, there's not enough research. You're wrong. It's uh, sugar's not the problem. It's cholesterol. And you know that whole story. So I left there. I guess it's been about 10 years now, but I, I said to Dr. Dellen, I said, there's more, I think there's more to your theory. Now, Dr. Dellen's professor of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. He didn't need my input, believe me. <laughs> but I said it, and he said, why don't you figure it out? I went, oh boy, now, now, now I got to do something. So I started Googling the literature that I really never read before. And I found Dr. Cook. He was at Stanford. He's a cardiologist by training. He's got a PhD in vascular biology. He studies one molecule, and it's in the book asymmetric dimethyl arginine. What the hell does that mean? And he called it the Uber marker. So he, I, I text him. 
He called me on the phone that day. It was amazing. He said, I like your idea, and I'll speed the story up. Come up to Stanford. Let's look at your theory and look at Dr. Dellen's theory with his molecule. We did that. I did the studies, and I came up with the hypothesis that that molecule blocks the nitric oxide pathway, the chemistry of it. In other words, the blood supply to the nerve. That's, that's what I figured out. But not then. It's just actually got figured out about a year ago. So I thought, okay, that's the autonomic nervous system. So the subtle symptoms, dryness of your skin, headaches, migraines, things that sinusitis, that's that's the autonomic nervous system. That's COVID-19, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. So I, I said, well, wait a minute. If if these patients who have diabetic neuropathy have elevated asymmetric dimethyl arginine, ADMA we'll call it, then all these patients in my study were, had other itises. MS was number one. And I said, well, wait a minute. If a nerve is inflamed and the blood supply is blocked off, it's not just going to happen to this nerve and this nerve and this nerve and this nerve. It must be every nerve. And it is. So that started me thinking back to Dr. Dellen. Now, his theory was or is that the polyol pathway, this is the biochemistry down in the weeds here. The polyol pathway is sugar inside the nerve. It breaks down to an alcohol sugar called sorbitol. Sorbitol causes water to pull into the nerve and the nerve swells. The second pathway is the Maillard reaction, which is sugar plus a protein causes the soft tissue surrounding the nerve to contract. So carpal tunnel. If the nerve going is going through a tunnel, the outside tunnel is getting smaller and the inside structure is getting bigger. I would call that compression. And that's what it is. And you do a decompression, a fasciotomy, give the nerve more space. And the feeling in these two our fingers comes back, this muscle works. Then I said, well, wait a minute. Nerve muscle function. Every process in the body is nerve muscle function. Even your gallbladder. Vagus nerve, muscle, function, bile. If it doesn't work from the autonomic first, then the sensory, which means pain, then the motor. That's diabetic neuropathy in a nutshell. That's every neuropathy process. So that's why I call it the global compression theory, because the same for every nerve throughout the body. So then I went back and I said uh, to Dr. Cook, I said, I'm confused about this cholesterol issue. And he said, here's, here's the answer. Because it's not true. It's, it's that simple. So I'll give you a metaphor, which is not in the book. So you hear it. He said, the lining of the blood vessel, which is called the endothelium, is like Teflon. And when sugar hits that, it makes it inflamed and it makes it like Velcro. These are his words. Mm. So a signal goes out to your liver and it's like an ambulance. Cholesterol comes to patch up that inflammation. That's called a plaque. That's why Vercal in the 1800s saw that plaque, atherosclerosis. It's an effect, not a cause. It's like saying you hear an ambulance every day and you look out the window and you see an accident. But there's an ambulance responding to it. You don't say ambulances are causing accidents. They're responding to the accident. You didn't see the accident, but you saw the response to it. So why is that all these statin drugs, which are just past the one trillion mark dollars, Wow. Really? For a disease that doesn't exist. Now I'm going to get a lot of hate mail from Big Pharma, and I, they've told me what a bad guy I am. I said, show me the paper where I'm wrong. They haven't sent it to me yet because it, they don't have it. But every doctor in America puts patients on cholesterol medication to lower their cholesterol. Without cholesterol, you die. Mm -hmm. So why would you do that? The answer is don't eat sugar. Well, doctor, I love sugar. Well, I do too. Everybody does, but it's a poison. So I then went back to all the different itises, like all the cranial nerves, 
So like uh, MS, that's the vagus nerve. So you get numbness, tingling in your feet, but you get these white spots in your brain and your cervical spine. And that was another tip off. If it's inflammatory disease and genetic, why is it not the entire, uh, the entire spine? That's an interesting fact. I think it's a epigenetic phenomenon. If you're carrying the genes and, you're eat, and you eat sugar, you're going to get that particular disease. If it's the next nerve over the ninth cranial nerve, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, there's that word again, mm -hmm. sclerosis, hardening of the nerves on either side of your neck caused by sugar, elevating your ADMA, asymmetric dimethylarginine, and that nerve, which supplies your swollen reflex, it goes into your lungs and you're dead. It takes about five years. So my thesis, and if you notice in, in, in inside the book, I say sugar plus trauma equals nerve dysfunction, because I think there is a traumatic factor, like ALS, 400% higher incidence in the NFL. Mm, now, those guys, you think they eat a lot of carbs? Can't oh, get to absolutely. 350 pounds unless you're eating carbs. They're chugging Gatorade all day long. Your your contribution from Florida. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, that's correct. And, and, and I understand why, because it, back to Ansel Keys, fat is bad, sugar is good by default. And that yes, it does have electrolytes, but it's basically sugar. That's mm -hmm. what it is. And now you're traumatizing those nerves. They get sclerotic and they don't function, or whatever organ system that is, we call them different names. That's ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, athlete, trauma, sugar, and you know the rest of the history. So then I just looked at all the, the um, cranial nerves, like I'm, I, I'm hypothesizing on some of this, but like the hypoglossal nerve, which goes right under your chin, but the nerve uh, nucleus is in the back of your brain, that gets traumatized preconception. That's autism. That's really controversial. But it is, by my theory and the papers that I've read, true. Now, there are a lot of other factors. It's a preconception. It's if the male is eating a lot of sugar, and the female is eating a lot of sugar, you spin the epigenetic wheel, you've got a probability of getting that outcome. Mm -hmm. Because when I was writing the paper, doing this research in the year 2000, in Scientific America, you can look it up, in February issue on autism written by an embryologist. And they found a difference of 1.1 millimeter in the base of the brain on day 22 to day 24 that we don't express a protein. And the difference in the normal brain at day 24 is 1.1 1 millimeter, millimeter smaller in the autistic kid. And that's where the hypoglossal nerve forms. That's nerve compression. That's and fascinating. Is the cause. And you look at the, the statistics out there when it comes to autism, it's predicted by the year 2032 that one in two children will be born on the autism spectrum. Exactly. And when I was reading that paper, it was 16 births in the year 2000. Imagine that, 16 births per 10,000. Wow. And and we're going to be one and two. Now, what what is the common denominator here? And I always kiddingly say this because it could happen and there was an incident. You could get hit by a meteorite or a bullet. Back to the 1800s, this guy's name was uh, Silas Mitchell. And I actually got his award. He's a, he was the first neurologist in the United States. Not, 1863 again. So he was studying neurology in France and came back and the Civil War broke out. He actually was at my hospital where I trained at University of Pennsylvania Hospital. Cool. I wasn't there the same year. Right. Plus, <laughs> he was there in the 1800s. And the Civil War broke out. He formed a clinic. And uh, one of his patients, he wrote it up. I thought it was amazing. It was a Union soldier stood up and he started to shoot to his left, took a musket under the chin where the hypoglossal nerve is rattled around came out the other side and caused a horner syndrome where you have dilation of one eye and constriction of the other and in this paper he says and it the musket ball caused quite a commotion with his nervous system and i thought 
Yeah, yeah. it did. <laughs> and it can. But sugar causes the most commotion, if you want to use his words, 1863. It's sugar. So in 18, why, why in the 1800s? Because the utilization of sugar was coming on strong. Columbus really uh, brought sugar back to the new, new world. Sugar was $1,000 a pound in England in the 1600s in our, our, our currency. So the rich were eating sugar all day long because it, it was like cocaine. Mm-hmm. They had sugar parties. So you started to see those diseases in the 1600s. Thomas Wills, first neurologist in Europe, and he started to describe those things. Then Charcot in the 1800s in France, and then Will or um, um, Silas Mitchell in Philadelphia. And then the incident started to go like this. 1974, high fructose corn syrup that introduced into the diet. And that autism number, that's where I think it really took off. Because okay. 1974, let's say on average 20 years for uh, first pregnancy, just for an average, so the math is easy, that would be 1994. And then you see the numbers start to go up. And now we're going to, as you say, one and two. Stephanie Seneff, I don't know if yep. you did. MIT researcher, yep, brilliant. Okay, and I consulted with her. She taught a she taught me the shikimate pathway when I was mm-hmm. writing the book, and we were going to write a book on the um, on the gene or on the biome. Oh, it's, cool! It's, yeah, about five years ago. But I'm doing another book. She is actually doing a book. You need to interview her. She's she, her book is coming out in June. Okay, I will. And she's a rock star in this subject. And the and then and the chemical that she talks about is glyphosate. Mm-hmm. Okay, so high fructose corn syrup. 80% of all the food in the United States has high fructose corn syrup in it. And I don't know if you know this, I didn't know this at the time. High fructose corn syrup is made by putting the corn in a, a, a sodium hydroxide, which is lye, to separate the corn, the starch from the hulk. But the catalyst they use, they don't use it now, but they were using it for many years, is mercury. Wow. So. of all the food in the United States has high fructose corn syrup. And at one time, a third of that had mercury in it. And you weren't wondering why we have autism. And it's grown with glyphosate, which Mm -hmm. is Monsanto's herbicide in Roundup. Now, Stephanie is the world's leading authority on this. Mm -hmm. Now, I I do some interesting things. I call the best people in the world. and, And I called her. I said, walk me through this biochemistry because it's, she's brilliant. So she's just teaching me one-on-one. I did the same thing with Dr. Cook. He's, he's written 500 articles. Now I read a lot of them, but hey, Dr. Cook, just explain it to me. Dr. Dellen, explain it to me. And they, and they do. And that's what the book is about. So they did the heavy lifting. I just connected the dots. And I did it with many other doctors too. Uh, Michael Hamlin at Harvard and other superstar in the laser portion of this. Uh, Dr. Filler is a neurosurgeon over UCLA. He gave me some other ideas. So everybody contributed to what I'm saying. Uh, Now, what I'm saying is extremely controversial. Mm -hmm. But I think if you get exterior to this problem and look at it, and you have to accept the fact that the cholesterol hypothesis, I don't know what what word would you call that? Is that bad science? It's I don't think uh, you guys are it, that stupid. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it's intentionally bad science because it makes people a lot of money. Do you think that's it? Yeah, wow, well, uh, I think you might have a case for that. Yeah, I mean, well, so yeah. they came up with the United States Department of Agriculture, the the food pyramid. That's a clever little device. Eat six to eleven helpings of carbohydrates. You will need the drugs that we're going to make for you. Mm. That's what that means. That's criminal. Absolutely criminal. I agree. But it's true. Yeah. And anybody says contrary, they attack us. They just attack us. Now we have COVID-19. Okay. My mask is over here. Should I put it on? No, please don't. Nothing. This is <laughs> absolutely nothing. You can put two on. You can, the only effective way to keep the virus out is put a plastic bag around your head and tie it. <laughs> the only effective way. Well, before, before before we talk about the COVID-19 and the mask, because I agree with you, 
one more point on Stephanie Seneff, and I've and I've given lectures on on her work as well, and I showed well, she has proven with her work that the glyphosate actually pushes the metals deeper inside of the tissue, the mercury, uh, the lead, uh, well, the lead goes in the bone, but different he heavy metals go into the tissue deeper as a result of the glyphosate. So it's a multitude of things that you're speaking about. It's the sugar, it's the glyphosate, it's this hybridized fruit that we have here, and it's also the, the metals that are around. So I just wanted to make that point. I absolutely agree with you, and I'm going to get her on my show. I don't wear a mask. Um, I have a t-shirt that says, my microbiome is my mask. And I am totally with you, Doc, because uh, if you have a healthy immune system, wouldn't you be able to handle a vir any virus? Isn't that the case? Perfect segue into the answer to the question. You're absolutely, absolutely correct. But the messaging we're getting from Dr. Fauci mm -hmm. is a, for sure, mixed message. He never once has told us how to not get it. A vaccine does not prevent you from getting this virus. And first of all, it's not even a vaccine. It attenuates maybe your response to the virus, but you're still going to get the disease. So why is that? Well, this is this is my way of thinking. So I haven't had microbiology in a long time, been on many years, but what what is a virus? A virus, there's a debate in biology for the last 150 years, is it alive or dead? Is it? So let, let's say, I have a little piece of paper here. Let's call this a virus. Can you read that? Probably not. No, but but, but I see it. So it's on the table here. It's, it's microscopic, like 10 microns. So it floats around. I breathe it in. I breathe it out. Why do some people die and other people don't? Now, it's interesting. On page 28, or at least in my book, you have that. Let's see if you have that. Is that the paperback? I have the hardback here. Um, on, on page or page 25, I talk about the biochemistry of that on the ADMA, L-arginine. Yeah, same page. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So using that, and I was not thinking of viruses. I was thinking chronic inflammation, sugar equals chronic inflammation plus trauma equals nerve damage, pain, and dysfunction. So let's talk about page 25, the biochemistry, ADMA. So this is how I like to explain it. So this little virus, which is just basically RNA, which is information. So it's floating around, maybe can live three to five days on this table here. Then it needs a host, doesn't find a host, it dies. If it finds a host and it, you're going to breathe it, even with a mask, it's going to look around the room. Let's say this room is a, um, a cell, a lung cell. And it's got a lot of machinery in here and it's got a copy machine over there in the corner. So it floats in there. And if your immune system is down and there's several factors, that's what that ADMA is. You have to read the book to really get the full impact. So L-arginine converts to nitric oxide. And, and when it converts to nitric oxide, it dilates the blood vessel. So the immune system is very healthy. It kills anything that comes in in the room here. But if you have asymmetric dimethyl arginine coming in, it blocks the nitric oxide pathway, and you're going to produce an opposite chemical called peroxynitrite, which is a vasoconstrictor. So in other words, you're turning the blood supply on with a good immune system. You're turning it off with a bad. Second factor, there's a big word, tetrahydrobioturin, which is... And notation is BH4, B6, B12, folic acid, and good old vitamin C. If those are low, you'll produce more. And the symbol is OONO. -O. Nitric oxide is NO mm -hmm. and O no. <laughs> yeah. Bad stuff. Perfect. So you're turning off the blood supply. So this guy, Mr. Virus, he needs to raise his family. He's a nice guy, but he, he needs a host. So he goes, he says, he's not very polite. I don't think he says, may I use your copy machine, your DNA. But you're a slave because your immune system is, you can't fight off the white cells and the T cells. So he goes over and, and makes a million copies. Fills your lungs with fluid. You can't exchange oxygen because you turn that off. And he breathes it out and goes on his merry way. 
That's how I look at COVID-19. Tell the truth. It's sugar. Mm -hmm. 94% of the people in the, right here, I'm on the hospital campus, 94% of the people at that hospital right there in Scottsdale have diabetes or cardiovascular disease, and it's caused by sugar, and they die. 94%. If you take, if you don't eat sugar, take vitamin D. There was a good study and just came out in um, 2017 in Korea on elderly patients. The, the higher their ADMA level, which is an inflammatory marker, the lower their vitamin D. Mm. Raise your vitamin D, inflammatory marker goes back to normal or better. So take vitamin D, vitamin C, little zinc, maybe melatonin, and don't eat sugar, and you have a 99.9% .9 chance of not dying from that disease. Now, have you heard that message? Absolutely no. not. Yeah, no. because there's no money in that sense. Exactly. I mean, when we look at what, who funds mainstream media, it's the big food companies, it's the big pharma. So they don't want to get that message out there. It doesn't make sense. H have you seen any studies that have shown an asymptomatic carrier can spread COVID-19? I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think the virus is viable everywhere. It's really a host resistant thing. Okay. So, if your immune system's down, it gets in there, you're going to get sick because it, I think it has been weaponized. I think that spike protein, um, which has a lot to do with the vascular supply. Um, and you're, you're not going to be able to exchange oxygen. That's really what matters. That's why the patients are on ventilators. If you have a patient who can't breathe and, and, and you put them in a ventilator, that assists them in breathing. Mm -hmm. But if they can't exchange the oxygen, you're, you can jump on their chest with a truck. They're not going to exchange. They're going to die. So all these medicines that are, no, I don't want to get into medicine. I, that's not really where I should go. I'm all the prevention guy, how not to get it. And if you do those things, you'll probably have a much better chance of making it. And if you do get it, I think you won't get as sick. Okay. But it's not being told. And, and the studies are not being done with what I just said. Right. Now we can shut the whole world down. All they have to do is read page 25. It's right there. Mm -hmm. I didn't make it up. That This is from Stanford. This is Dr. Cook. I didn't make that up. The papers are in the thousands of papers. I mean, doesn't anybody read these papers? Yeah. No. Not no, it's, exactly. Well, that's why these conversations like this are so important, Doc, because hopefully this inspires people not to get triggered by a conversation like this, but to get curious about it and go look at some of the research. Go read page 25, understand how the body actually works. I have found that when you understand this and really study it and you're more competent, then you're going to be more confident when you're out there. and You're not going to be living in fear, which could also wipe out your immune system. So step number one is to just understand and, and research how your body works, look into the science, and you'll be empowered to, to do so because it's, it's, it's absolutely true. I agree with you. I'm totally aligned with you. And a lot of people are looking for a, a simple solution like a vaccine when the vaccine is not really preventing you from getting it. What they're claiming is that it's 95% effective at producing similar proteins that are similar to the antibodies, but we don't know what those proteins could turn into in a year, two years, three years. So it's still experimental. And uh, yeah, conversations like this are so important, Doc. So thank you. Yeah. And, and Fauci's been there for what, 40, 50 years? Yeah. I mean, He's on TV all the time. He changes his message every time I listen to him. Mm -hmm. Can he just get it down to basics? I mean, the other day he's saying, don't hug your grandkids. Mm. Um, wear two masks. When he first talked, he said, don't wear any. Now it's two masks. I mean, what's the message? The message is really our food supply in the United States is bad, bad. And it's causing all these diseases, cancer. It's causing, I shouldn't say it's causing cancer, but let's, let's stay on the virus for a second. So I, I looked this up the other day. I was thinking, okay, if I was a virus, how would I, what would I want? Well, I got to have a human cell. No, I shouldn't say human. I need a cell, live cell to operate in. So when you transport a, uh, any virus in a flask, you can't grow it on agar because it needs a cell, live cell. And you have to add nutrients to the, to the broth. You got to add sugar. 
Mm. Otherwise, the virus dies. Well, there's your answer right there. Yeah. Back to Otto Warburg, mm -hmm. uh, 1930 or so, and he got the Nobel Prize. What did he do? Took a cancer cell, basically fed him fructose, which was amazing back then. Fructose was a very small portion of our diet then. Cancer cells flourished. Mm -hmm. Took the fructose away, and the cancer cells died. Same as the virus. You take this, the food supply away from these organisms, and they die. It's, or if you feed them, you die. That's if, I mean, I'm not telling people don't eat sugar. I'm just saying if you do, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. So my new book, I was looking at titles, and, I, and I, I'm going to call it um, a lot of different titles, but Sugar, Sick, Dead. <laughs> it's good. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sitting. You know, this is interesting. I've been around a long time. So I did the first surgery that was ever done at our hospital in Scottsdale, the then new hospital. It was around 1980. And a friend of mine who was the medical director, he says, hey, can you bring a case up there? Because it was way up north, which is now the center of town. Because we built this new hospital. No one lives up there. We had a big recession. I said, sure. And um, the patient had diabetic uh, gangrene. And I remember her last name was Ford. Because the only reason I remember it because Nancy Reagan cut the ribbon to the OR and I did the first surgery. Nancy Reagan's dad was a neurosurgeon. His name was Thomas, his last name was Davis, and he was retired in Scottsdale. That's why. So I did the first surgery there. So I was ruminating over that thought when I was up at the North Hospital about a year ago and I was sitting at a Starbucks drinking. I, bring my own butter and put butter in my coffee. Nice. That's what I, do. I, love I love it. it. But Starbucks, you know, is selling sugar. Yeah. Right. That's how they make their money. Coffee yeah. is expensive. Sugar is cheap. Make it a frappe. So I'm sitting there watching people coming out with their caramelized death threats. And the hospital's across the street. And I'm going, sugar, sick. And there's a cemetery at 90th Street and Shea right by the hospital. So I went, oh. Sugar, sick, dead. Hmm. It's that simple. Sums it all up in, in three words. Pretty clear. Yeah. Now, does it taste great? Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. It's a, it's a drug. And we all have eaten it. I didn't know this when I was growing up. I ate it like, you know, we, we drank Coke for breakfast if we could, you know. Mm -hmm. and, it, and we didn't know better. Now, I think we should know better, but, but we're still being – broadcast these lies mm -hmm. and we're paying for it with our own tax dollars. And now we're wearing these masks and being sequestered and we're ruining not only the country, the whole planet, something very, very sinister behind this. And it's more than just, I think it's more than just money. It just doesn't make sense. It's yeah, insanity. It's, yeah. It's money and control. And, and uh, you could call this conspiracy or whatever, but you got to just open your eyes and see what's going on. I, um, I mentioned that I don't wear a mask, right? And when I'm flying on an airplane, I have to wear a mask. So right. I, I, I personally use like a non-toxic one with silver mesh. So for times that, like that, I'll wear a non-toxic one. But I also believe when I, I'm in Florida, so thankfully Florida's open. I think uh, Arizona is similar. Very when, similar. When I go to, let's say like the yeah, there's park, big bugs down there. There's big yeah, bugs we do have big bugs. <laughs> yeah, okay. but it's beautiful here, doc. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, when I'm walking in my streets, for example, I live in this area called Bay Harbor Islands, which is right north of Miami Beach. There are signs on every corner here that says you have to wear a mask. Masks are mandatory to walk around here. And I have counted every single time that I've been stopped by a police officer for walking my dog outside without a mask 19 times. And out of those 19 times, I'm yet to wear a mask. I have a conversation with them. I'll let them know that I'm not sick. Masks are for sick people. I'm healthy. This will make me worse. And then I go on with my way. But the reason I'm sharing that is because I believe when I show up there and other people see me doing that, it gives them the inspiration to actually stand up for what they truly believe is right, which is the fact that we have an immune system, we have our rights. And if we start giving away our freedom just by that, like making sure we put on a mask, double mask, wherever we go, what's next, right? Are we going to be forced to take a vaccination? So for me, I, I, I'll have to stand my ground. You know, I'm walking around here and I'm standing my ground every day. And I'm proud of you. I don't have the guts to do that. <laughs> uh, 
See, I'm in the medical profession. See, I mean, they, they turn me in. Who do you, right. Yeah. Who it's different. Know? Yeah. And I try to tell them, but they had this old people scared. They are really scared. They're being sequestered at home. They're not, they need the vitamin D go outside. Mm-hmm. Get some vitamin D. That's all you need. Don't eat sugar. They look at me like I'm crazy. Well, Dr. Fauci didn't say that. Hmm. Wonder why. Why doesn't he say that? Why isn't he being asked that question? Get him on your show. Ask him that. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Did he get his to come on your show? I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, his, his PR team will shut that down. You know, if yeah. they look at any of my work, they'll be like, no, we're not going to have you on there. <laughs> But you're right. You know, people need to ask him those questions, but he's he's protected. You know, I want to get back to go ahead. Well, I just want to compliment you because I've given a lot of podcasts. It's people like you that are not doctors are really getting the truth out. Doctors are not telling the truth. They're telling the company line. Every doctor in America puts patients on statin drugs. Why? Because it's standard of care and they're not thinking. And they get criticized and ostracized if they don't do it. So they just do it. But it's crazy. It is. It's criminal. It's absolutely criminal. Uh, and thank you for the acknowledgement. I, I get some heat for it, right? I'm sure some people are going to get turned off just from this conversation. But it's the truth. And you got to stand up for what you believe is true. Uh, right. I, I believe that. You know, I want to share real quick uh, a brief story of, of my father. My, my father immigrated here from Iran in the 1970s with my mom. He followed a standard American diet, right? He ate a whole bunch of sugar, sugar. He drank these sweet and iced teas. And growing up, I did the same thing. I was actually obese until I was 24 years old because I was addicted to sugar. I was addicted to a standard American diet. My dad had developed type 2 diabetes, and he really had really bad diabetic neuropathy. He called me one day back in 2013. He, had, he couldn't even walk to the bathroom. He, it was so bad. So we picked him up, took him to Mount Sinai Medical Center here in Miami Beach. We... They admitted him into the uh, emergency room, and my dad was so worried about getting his, his feet amputated that in the hospital, he suffered a massive stroke, left him paralyzed, left him with the inability to speak. Nine months later, he, he passed away, right? So that's that's actually what's, what sparked me from treating health and teaching health from a hobby to a purpose. And I share that because I know the information that you share, Doc, that I that I share, that we talk about on these episodes, it's the same information that would have saved my father's life. Absolutely. So, so I want the audience to understand that if you are diabetic, if you have a family member who's diabetic, can you please empower them and share with them how incredible the human body is and that it's capable of actually healing from these conditions? Yeah, one of the, back to your diet in Iran, which was really a, probably more of a keto type diet. Yeah, Mediterranean. Yeah. Um, even here in the American Indians, which are horribly obese, the amputa- amputation rate is 50% by age 40 here. Jeez. The American natives of the United States are really of Asian descent. They were, they were warriors. I mean, when you look at back in the pictures in the 1800s, they, had, they, were, they were ripped. They were eating off the land. Once they were put on a reservation, they were fed crap food, and, that, and they were 300 pounds and have diabetes and all the other related diseases. And they're not being told the truth. Absolutely not. So it's in every country in the world now. We export this high fructose corn syrup, put it in everything. We export. But a lot of countries don't take our um, genetically modified Monsanto seed. Italy's a good example. Hmm. Um, they're because have you been to Italy? No, I haven't. <laughs> they smoke and eat pasta all day long and they're skinny. I don't know how they do it, but they're, they're not eating what we're eating. And um, so it is the diet. It fundamentally what this glyphosate, just that one amino acid, which is glycine, it was hooked up with phosphate and then put in that uh, seed it has caused a tsunami of death throughout the world. And Monsanto, who used to own it, now Bear owns it. Mm -hmm. They're the major, major funder of the science at these uh, universities. Number one, I'm over there. I'm giving a lecture on the microbiome and the biochemistry department. I won't say what university. And I say, I can prove that glyphosate in the microbiome 
And I can tell you what the electrical output on the nerve in the foot will be by the organisms that are eating this crap, going up the vagus nerve to the hippocampus, all that stuff. I can do that. And you have the science to prove it. Guess who I was talking to? Monsanto. They, <laughs> they didn't want the They did not want to hear that. Oh, is it? That's a great study. <laughs> we'll get back to you. <laughs> because it, it the fix, that's why Fauci says, I, now, now I'll get death threats on this, or Biden says, follow the science. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because he knows they bought the science. That's why he says that. That's awful. That's awful. No, okay, my phone will be ringing. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, there's a black car outside. I don't know what that means. Now, kudos to you for speaking the truth. You're speaking the truth. You know, if anybody just actually follows the science, they'll see that. Um, yes. it's, it's corrupt. Yeah, yeah our best interest is, I always say this. I always say, look at what the government promotes and do the exact opposite, and you'll be yeah. down the right direction. I have some debates with some scientists, and I say, this is really a brash thing to say. I say, are you that stupid? Or are you on the take? Now, they always tell me they're the brightest guy in the room, and they are. So by default, I know you've been bought. Yeah. So that yeah. puts them in a dilemma, but they know they have. But they're, they're trapped because you don't get a grant, grant from National Institute of Health. National Institute of Health, by the way, is funded by the Farm Bureau. The, the Farm Bill, ah. NIH is under that. It's a trillion dollars, a trillion. They don't grow any corn. They subsidize all this stuff. They subsidize the science. And I always wonder why do politicians go to Iowa for their first caucus? And the answer is because that's where the money is, $1 trillion. So Hillary shows up, and I don't care about the politics there. Yeah. Hillary shows up, hi, Hillary, how much do you want this year? And then this guy and this guy. And then Trump showed up. Oh, you're a buffoon. You're not going to make it anyway. You know the rest of the story. <laughs> yeah. they, they bet on every horse in the race. They can't lose. It's and crazy. here we are. Crazy talk. So, yeah, yeah, great share. And this is not political. It's just the truth. You it's know, if true. anybody, it's anybody all, it's look true. exactly. I understand. I mean, uh, money buys a lot of stuff. I don't think they purposely, the people, the scientists, it just, that's, they ask you to do a study like PepsiCo. Can you do it? Here's $3 million. Prove that, you know, PepsiCola doesn't cause whatever. And they'll come back with the answer. And when they publish it, this, this is a true statement. 11 out of 12 studies, just this is a study just came out. They were funded by a big uh, uh, sugar industry, said that sugar didn't cause the problem. When it was independent, it was 11 out of 12 said they did. Mm. Well, you know, you know, who's buying the, the information? I think the public knows it, though. They know the fix is in, but they don't know the connection with COVID-19 and they are scared. Yeah. And you're right. You're you got guts. Take that mask off. Now, I'm not advocating because they'll arrest me for that. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I would say just look at this. Just look. I mean, look, look on page 25. It's not that complicated. It's sugar. Yeah. Try it. Don't eat sugar. Get vitamin D, vitamin C, little zinc, maybe melatonin, and go outside and get some sun. Not as much sun as I got because I got a basal cell out of here. Um, and uh, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine. It's empowering. It's really, really. I mean, that's that's what it takes for your body to actually handle it and, and open up the. See, I would do this. This is how I would do it for the restaurants. If I was the czar, which I'm not, obviously, I'd say if you serve ketogenic diet, you can open your restaurant. But if you're <laughs> serving sugar, you can't. That's good. I love that you idea. Love that? I love it. Yeah. And all the restaurants would open. Yeah. And people would get on a healthy diet and uh -huh. we would be empowered and this country would flourish. Yeah. This is, this is an absolute disgrace to the United States. Absolute disgrace. And people should be outraged just like you are and your audience. What, what's the age group of your audience? Uh, 35 to 45, mostly females. Yeah. Okay. Well, they're, they're the head of the family in a sense. They're making the meals. They're, they're making those decisions. And they're, they're, they can be empowered to change this whole outcome. Because I'm sure they're, they want to send their kids back to school for sure. Yeah. And they're being sequestered. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully in Florida schools are open. Uh, in certain states schools are open. You know, let's, let's, let's transition doc real quick. Cause, uh, we're running out of time here. I want to speak about sugar addiction, right? You had mentioned that it's more addicting than cocaine and, uh, what it does to suppress leptin, which is the hormone that helps you feel full. I know a lot of people who attempt keto, they give it a try and they fall off track. They just get that, that hippocampus lights up, give me sugar, give me carbs, and they fall off track. So what are some, some practical steps for somebody who wants to do keto, but they keep just falling off track because of this sugar addiction? What can they do? Well, for me, I had that addiction, did not know I had that addiction. And I thought, well, when I was writing the book, oh, I can get off of sugar. Well, it was not that easy. I put butter in my coffee and that just changed everything. And now I'm a coffee drinker, so it was, I, it was easy. And I love butter, so I put it in, and it tastes great. Yeah. So, and I was surprised. That's been around for centuries. Italians, they, that's what they used to do. They put butter in their coffee. The Tibetans put butter in their tea. Yeah. It was not, human beings eat fat. That's their natural diet. Sugar is not the natural diet. Now, maybe 10,000 years ago, the king, if you notice, the king was always fat. Right. He's the guy that said, why don't you climb up that tree and get some honey? Because I love honey. It's sweet. Everybody else was skinny. King uh, Henry VIII, perfect example. He was fat. They were skinny. He was sick. They were healthy. So, so it, the, it will continue to go on and on and on. So... Yeah, absolutely. So the, the goal, so butter in your coffee. I love that too. I do it in my coffee. You can also put it in your tea. Uh, I put a little bit of some sea salt in mine as well to kind of replenish the electrolytes. Um, what about the role of protein, doc? Does protein help with some of those satiety hormones? I know that I've seen it help with cholecystokinine, peptide YY. Like increasing protein, can that help with the sugar addiction? Well, you, you can make glucose out of protein and you can make glucose out of fat, gluconeogenesis. Um, I think there's a misnomer of getting too much protein because protein is loaded up the kidneys. So there are a bunch of studies done. Just eating carbs, you die. Just eating protein, you die. Your kidneys will shut down. If you just eat fat, you live forever, basically. Now, most of us like a balanced, quote unquote, balanced diet for, for, uh, for, for the, the fact that that's what we were raised on. Yeah. But theoretically, all you need is fat because you'll make your own sugar. So there's the carnivore diet. And, and are you in the carnivore diet? I use it as a tool. I, I go back and forth. I'm actually doing it right now. I'm doing 30 days of it. I'm on day nine right now. So I go, I use it as a tool. Yeah. I, I think genetically, men can do carnivore diet much easier than women because yeah. I think physiologically and anthropologically, we were uh, geared to do that because if we went out on a hunt, we could be gone for two, three, four weeks and we needed the carnivore diet. There were no carbs. Perhaps women in the cave in those days, mm -hmm. they had to be around the cave. They had to have fermented food and things like that and roots and herbs. So they're probably more tuned to be herbivores than we are, but we're, we're omnivores. We can eat anything. Yeah. And I do the same thing. I have to have a steak. Every once in a while, I, I just don't feel good. And probably the B vitamins that we get through that, mm -hmm. genetically, we, we need that. So I, I would agree with you. Yeah, I, I feel really great when I do it. You know, I, I don't do it for longer than 30 days or so, 40 days, but I throw it into the mix. Help heal, it helps heal the gut, getting rid of the anti-nutrients. Right. Uh, so got it. So more fat, that's the answer. You know, increase yeah. the fat, put it in your coffee, and your body will start to adapt over time. Um, what about artificial sweeteners? You know, when we talk about keto, there they're, are, yeah, what are the good ones versus the bad ones? Yeah, they're, they're a poison. Um, so there's a, there's a history on that because that was GD Cyril that it went before Reagan was the president and they tried to get it through the FDA and it failed. So Reagan appointed another person and that was Donald Rumsfeld was the head of GD Cyril, by the way. Interesting. And they didn't pass it. And what is that? Those um, artificial sweeteners is sugar molecule cleave with formaldehyde, mm -hmm. embalming fluid. That's so aspartame, sucralose is what you're referring They're to. They're all the same. Anything yeah. that ends in OIC. Mm -hmm. So they're artificial. But there's it's still a sugar molecule with a toxin. So 
interestingly enough, the first Gulf War was called Gulf War uh, disease, uh, which was the ne neurologic disease that the uh, Air Force people were getting and some sailors in Vietnam, or not in Vietnam, in Gulf War. Mm -hmm. Well, it was the diet soda uh -huh. on the tarmac in Iraq and Iran, and the places, not Iran, Iraq, and it heated it up to like 130 degrees, and that wow. changed that into methyl alcohol. And two teas or two tablespoons of methyl alcohol, which is in a six pack of Diet Coke, will kill you. Wow. And that's where that came from. And it's interesting because Donald Rumsfeld was the head of that company, and he was also Secretary of Defense of that war. Mm -hmm. How ironic is that? That's nuts. Oh, my yeah. gosh. What about um, stevia and, and monk fruit? Monk fruit, I think, is pretty good. Uh, it's sweet, uh, but it's not really a sugar per se. Uh, stevia is pretty much the same. They're sweet, but they're not sugars. Um, but once you get on a ketogenic diet, you don't even want to eat that because that sweet taste is uh, foreign to you. And you said all of the ones that end with OSE. So even allulose would be considered one of the bad ones? Yes. So OSE is a sugar. OL, like alcohol, mm -hmm. is a sugar alcohol. So okay. Got it. Last question for you before we wrap it up. Your book, Sugar Crush, which you could get on Amazon. We'll put a link down below. Is there anywhere else you want them to go get the book? I think that's the best source of the book. It came out in audio last year. I think they did a terrific job. I was listening to it. I thought they rewrote the book. No, it's word for word, but the guy does such a great job. Awesome. So it's available on Amazon, on Audible. We'll put a link for it down below. What's the one thing, if you had to choose one thing, that you want the reader or listener of your book to get from your book? Every inflammatory disease that you have, whether it's Sjogren's disease or some esoteric irritable bowel, it all can be chased back to sugar. Eliminate sugar. See if you get better. It's that simple. Awesome, Doc. Well, I want to acknowledge you. Well, first of all, where can we find your work? Where is more Where is more areas for us to check you out? Well, I, I'm still in private practice. So my extremity health centers, uh, which is my practice, I do have a website, Sugar Crush the Book. I try to post a lot of stuff there. Um, but I think the book says it all basically has a diet, diet in the back and it's not that complicated biochemistry. You can get bogged down a little bit, but the, the thought is that's causing your problem. And if you eliminate sugar, you should be better, but it's not easy. Yeah. Get this book for anybody, you know, who's diabetic, pre-diabetic, insulin resistant for yourself. I want to acknowledge you doc for the incredible research. Your, your history of what you've done is, is amazing. I just love it. I'm glad we connected. I, I'm, I love the book that you've written here. You are uh, really a trailblazer. I know you've taken a lot of arrows, so thank you for still. Yes, I have. Yeah. Thank you for pushing forward and just speaking the truth. I really enjoyed today's conversation. I look forward to doing it again. Maybe when you're in Miami or I'm in Arizona, mask free, we could have another. Mask free, you're on. And I, I'm not just saying this. I'm just emboldened by your taking the time to understand the problem and digging deep for your patient, not your patient, for your audience. Because that's what we should have been doing, and we didn't do it. We're just feeding patients drugs and not telling them the truth. That's thank you, Doc. Yeah, thank you so much.